aptly defends. Hey, uh, my name's Ethan, and a lot of you I know, and it's so good to be home. A lot of you I don't, because it's been eight years, and a lot of people keep joining this amazing church. Uh, I'm sorry that that video just ruined good life days for you. Up till now, it had been a pretty good week, so sorry about that. Uh, hello to all the campuses. I lose track. There's so many new ones. Abingdon and Aberdeen and Edgewood and Mountain Road. Um, so hello to all of you. It's good uh, to be worshiping together uh, with you. Um, like Jared said, we've been gone eight years, but we feel like we're coming home. Um, this is where Betsy and I raised our boys here just to give you a sense. This is what we looked like when we got here uh, with two little ones in our arms. I think we got a picture. Do we have a picture of us when we got here somewhere? Oh yeah, there it is. Yeah, holding those little kids. This is what we looked like when we left. And then this is what we looked like two days ago at Jerusalem, hiking at Jerusalem Mills. So here we are. Everybody keeps uh, changing. Uh, but like George said, my roots go back farther than the 10 years my family spent here. Uh, this church uh, is my father's home church, and it is his father's home church, and it is his father's home church all the way back to the late 1800s. So we go a long way back uh, in this church, not quite all 200 years, but a lot of it. And while I was on staff here, uh, I found myself drawn to study the history of this church, in part because I was serving here, but in part because it was also uh, the history of my family. And so when I got back, I got asked back to be here on this weekend, I found myself just asking myself the question, what unique contribution could I make to the 200th birthday celebration of Mountain Christian Church? I began to wonder, was there any unique attribute that I could identify that had been true about this church for the whole 200 years? And at first I thought of some of the obvious candidates, but you already talked about most of those with your kickoff series back in January. You know, for all of 200 years, this church has been faithful to Scripture and exalting the name of Christ and focused on discipleship. That's all true, but it's all obvious. And then I began to think about all the things that, that hadn't been the same over 200 years, things that were constantly changing Worship styles were changing. Uh, dress code. I mean, 100 years ago, I'm not sure I could have gotten in the building like this. And now they told me, make sure you dress casually uh, when you preach. And so you know, the dress code has changed. The locations have changed. The programs have changed. Since I've been gone, Luke's hair keeps changing. <laughs> what is up with that, you know? And, and really, in fact, things are changing so rapidly that last night, in a moment of honesty, sitting around a campfire, uh, Ben promised that this fall he was going to cheer for the Ravens. So that's a pledge that Ben has made, and I heard it. So, so they're going like to say, so things are changing, right? But was there something that hadn't changed? You know, Mountain is a big church. Has it always been a big church? Well, no. In fact, the first hundred years, it was quite small. Uh, Mountain is a church with great bands. Wasn't the band amazing? I'm always struck by how amazing the bands are. Yeah. Maybe that's something we could say has always been true. Well, but no, Mountain was a cappella for the first couple decades of its existence. Uh, what about all these locations and community centers and all that? That's so incredible. And that's been here a long time. But honestly, I remember when that started. That hasn't been true for 200 years. And I began to despair wondering if I could identify some unique attribute of this church that we could say had been true without fail, without compromise, the whole time, from even before the founding up until the present day. And then finally, it dawned on me. I went back and I checked the records, I analyzed the historical data so that I could be confident, and I did determine one thing that I could say had been true of this church for more than 200 years. True from before its founding up until the present day. This church has beautiful feet. I mean like pedicure for a pool party. Beautiful feet, this church. And to demonstrate this right now, if you would all take your shoes and socks, we're going to do an inspection. No, no, no. That won't be necessary. Some of you are wearing sandals. It'll be much easier than that. No, no. Even that won't be necessary. 
Maybe you're a visitor here today and you're thinking, how can he be so sure? Is there some membership screening method by which they determine that all the people of this church for 200 years have had beautiful feet? But no, none of that will be necessary. Keep your socks on. For I have the means at my disposal to prove my conjecture beyond reasonable doubt without the need to inspect anyone's shoes and socks. Because I've been watching this church carefully for nearly 50 years. My family stories go back around 100 years before that. And I have studied the history and the primary sources with care most of my life. And of all the things you can say about this church, some have changed and some have not. Something that has been true faithfully and consistency, consistently since before its founding is that the people of this church, I'm talking about you, have beautiful feet. Now, to understand this claim, you have to know how the Bible defines beautiful feet. Beautiful feet are defined for us by a prophet named Isaiah. In Isaiah 52, verse 7, here's what he says. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. This definition from Isaiah is given in an oracle meant for a people who are trapped in a desperate situation. They have been trapped in hopelessness and despair for decades, and they see no way out. And this oracle is for them, and he says, if someone were to show up, in the middle of your desperate, hopeless situation, if someone were to show up there and they brought good news, oh my goodness, boy would they have beautiful feet. This is like the doctor walks into the exam room and he says, the cancer is gone. Or the pilot who gets on the intercom and he says, folks, I know it's been a scary ride, but I'm taking the seatbelt sign off. It's going to be smooth sailing all the way to a smooth landing. The danger has passed. Or like a teacher who calls you up to the front of the class and whispers in your ear, you passed the test. You're going to graduate. I know you were so afraid. It was touch and go there for a little while, but you're going to make it. You did it. And Isaiah says, when that happens, when into a situation of fear and despair and hopelessness, a messenger emerges who says, I bring good news. That person has beautiful it reminds me of the, the legend of the, um, of the Battle of Marathon. You know that race that crazy people run, right? The thing, 26.2 miles. Did you know that race is named for a, a Greek legend of the Battle of Marathon? And the story goes that the Persian army, the unbeaten, unstoppable Persian army was attacking Greece. And they had sent their navy around to besiege the city of Athens while the army marched south down the peninsula and they were going to crush the city of Athens between the army and the navy. And the Persians never lost, and so everybody knew how it would end. But nevertheless, the Athenians sit there, sent their army out and they marched out to meet the Persian army at, near the town of Marathon. And there, to everyone's surprise, the Athenians... One, like nobody saw this coming. And they didn't just win. They just destroyed the Persian army. The Persian army was completely scattered and Athens was saved, except it was besieged by the navy 25 miles away. And, and the victorious army worried, what if the city of Athens surrendered before the news of our victory got back to them? Because again, nobody expected them to win. And so one soldier took off his armor and took off his heavy shoes and began to run. Run like his life and the life of everyone he knew depended on it. More than 25 miles and he arrived at the gates of Athens to say, Don't surrender, for we have won the victory. 
And according to legend, he then promptly died. Which is why I question the sanity of all those who run marathons today. Don't you know the first person who ever did it died? Like, read your history, folks. Okay, but that guy, think about that guy's feet, right? When he arrived at the gates of Athens, having run either barefooted or in light leather sandals, his feet would have been bloody and bruised and broken. And Isaiah says, oh my goodness, those are beautiful feet. That's what beautiful feet looks like. And I just want you to know, I've been watching this church. That's what your feet look like. Now, to understand what Isaiah is saying, you've got to know the news that is being brought. So let's read on a little bit. Let's read about the news that the beautiful feet are bringing. Isaiah 52, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. And remember, this is to a people for decades trapped in a hopeless situation. What's the news they bring? First, they proclaim peace. The war is over. And the end of a war is news, right? The end of a war is always news, but it's either good news or bad news because you got to know who won. The second thing they say is they proclaim glad tidings, good tidings to a people that hadn't gotten good news in a long time. They proclaim salvation to a people who needed to be rescued. And then the, the punchline, the, the thing they were waiting to hear, they say to Zion, Zion is this word that means God's people, they say to Zion, your God reigns. Which means, of course, that he, he won. He, he won the great battle. You see, they were living in a situation where they had begun to fear, could it be that perhaps our God has been defeated? Could it be that death won the battle? Could it be that despair won the battle? Could it be possible that the enemies of God won the battle? And the messenger comes and says, no, 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 no. Our God still reigns. The battle belongs to the Lord. And he says, not just this. He says, but if you'll just wait, if you will just trust in the Lord, you will see it with your own eyes. He says, he says listen, your watchmen, those who stand on the edge of the wall and look out for good news, they will lift up their voices. Together they will shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Verse 9, Isaiah says, Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. And then I love this image. This doesn't work when I'm preaching. Maybe if like Luke were preaching, it would work. But it, you know, he, it says, the Lord will bear his arms. When I bear my arms, that is not a threatening gesture. People sort of giggle. But you can imagine someone for whom rolling up your sleeves was, a, that's what it says, the Lord will roll up his sleeves in the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. And when I observe the history of this church from before its founding up until the present day, this is what I observe. Beautiful feet walking into despairing places to announce the good news that God won the victory. That is the history of this church. I look back and I see the beautiful feet of a guy named Samuel Rogers and his assistant, James McVeigh. Here, we got a picture of Samuel Rogers right there. Good looking fella, right? Good looking guy. Samuel Rogers had beautiful feet. He was from Kentucky, and um, he was a passionate minister of the gospel who got some training under some guys named Barton Stone and then Alexander Campbell. And, and he looked over a landscape uh, that was despairing for a particular reason. The church in America at that time was divided among thousands upon thousands of splintering denominations, and Christians spent almost all their time arguing over which denomination was better, and almost none of their time preaching hope to a despairing world. And so a lot of people, including Samuel Rogers, started traveling around to say, you know, we could just stop that. We could just be Christians only. 
just celebrate the victory of Christ and preach that to a despairing world, and we don't have to argue about the stuff. And so he came to Baltimore first in 1821 and then in 1823. And when he was there in 1821, there was a farmer from right around here in Hartford County down there selling food or whatever down in Baltimore City. And he hears this guy and he says, would you come back with me? I live in a little valley um, where there aren't very many Christians and what few Christians there are. We, we share a chapel, but we can't share a church. We can't take communion together. We can't worship together. We can't even fellowship together or study the Bible together because we're all different denominations and that's not allowed. Would you come back? And so he, he writes in his autobiography that he visited uh, what he calls the Gunpowder Valley of Harford County. We actually know exactly where he visited. If you're from up here, you just drive less than a full mile up, you'll see a sign that says the historic valley of the churches. You're turning right there. I think it's Joppa Road. I've forgotten my road names. But you turn right where that little sign is, drive 100 feet, kind of go into this little valley. That's the spot where Samuel Rogers came uh, a little more than 100 years ago. And he just said... I've got news. I've got good news. You could just focus on Jesus. Like all the stuff you've been arguing about and fighting about, you don't have to. You could just focus on Jesus. And they were intrigued, and they said, well, come back and tell us more. And he said, okay, I'll be here in 1823. So two years later, he came back. And he met with the families again, and they talked, and they prayed about it. And 11 of those, he describes, I love the way he says, he says, the Christians of Harford County were scattered and separated. That's what he says. And so he came back, and they decided, we don't want to be scattered and separated. We want to be unified. And so it, it, they got together in 1824. They started a little church, uh, the one we call Mountain Christian Church. And they didn't just start a church, they also decided they wanted beautiful feet too. And they knew how to get it. And so they became a people who took the message of hope, who took the message of God's victory into all the dark and despairing places that they knew about. And again, I, I don't even have time. I don't even have time to scratch the surface of the stories of the beautiful-footed people of Mountain Christian Church. Uh, I, I wish I could tell you all about 1840 when they heard about a small group of believers down in this brand new city called Washington City. Uh, you know, the capital had just been made, this new place called Washington City. But there was a little group of believers there, but they didn't have a building. And the Christians up here in Harford County thought, you know, it's our new capital. They ought to have themselves a new church building. And so they wrote letters, and we have copies of these letters. They wrote letters to churches all over the nation. And they just said, you know what we should do? We should all take up a collection to build a church building in what we now call Washington, D.C. This little church, this little tiny little church meeting in a log cabin said they need a church building. It's our fancy new capital. They need a building. And, and we led the movement to do that. 1877 uh, was the first time a bunch of the beautiful-footed people of Mountain Christian Church got together and said, you know what we're doing? We're leaving. We're going to take our beautiful feet, and we're going to leave and go start another church. And then they did it again and again and again. And some of you who have been around a little while, you know we just keep doing this. We just keep gathering groups of people, and we say, y'all got beautiful feet. You should leave and go start another one and another one and another one and another one. I, I, I wish I could tell you about all the times the beautiful feet of this church walked from one building to another, to another, to another, so that they could expand their capacity to welcome those who wanted to hear the good news. Here, I got one picture of this. Uh, this is uh, from the 1950s when we walked from the Little White Frame Church uh, to what we now call Walker Chapel, that magnificent, gorgeous Gothic cathedral up there. You see, we, we can go online, you can look at pictures of the little church they walked from to this massive church. Uh, they walk to. There they all lined up. And there's a lot to notice in this picture. But if you look at it very long, everybody who ever looks at this picture, first thing they say is, my goodness, they have beautiful feet. What was in the water back then? All those beautiful footed people. Uh, we have a picture also 
Uh, for the groundbreaking of this event, they held a little potluck dinner to celebrate how beautiful all their feet were. Here's a photo of that potluck dinner. Uh, just, for, just for indulgence sake, uh, if you can zoom in on the corner. Oh, good. There it is. This is fun. That's my grandma, Arlene. And that's my Uncle Jay. And that's my Uncle John. And that's my grandpa, James Magnus. And in the uncropped version of this photo, um, my father is standing right there. And you can see his fingers, just like four fingers, on my grandpa's shoulder. Um, uh, but that uncropped photo has been lost to time. I couldn't find it. Um, but I promise you, he was there at that pot. Look, because my dad has got beautiful feet too. And, and you may wonder, like, why did they, like, you go look at that building sometime and you just think 1950, like, it is massive and gorgeous and magnificent. And they had a perfectly functional church building. And you may wonder, why did they invest so much money and so much time and so much energy? It took them years to finish that building. Why did they make that massive investment? But I'll just tell you, you I don't have to wonder because I know because it's my family and they told me the story. They did it because they had heard this amazing news. They had heard this news that changed the whole world. They'd heard this news that meant there was hope in desperate situations, that meant that the enemies of God were losing the battle, no matter how much it looked like they might be winning the battle. And they had news for the world. And so they built that building as an announcement, as like a billboard to the world that God reigns and God loves and God heals and God restores. And then this church just kept on walking the gospel. This church just kept serving as messengers of the announcement of the victory of God. My family came here in 2005. I was so excited. I got to come work at my father and grandfather's and great-grandfather's home church, the church I had visited as a little boy. I was so honored. And, and one of the first things I wanted to do was meet people, right, and get to know the people of the church. And it was wonderful because I'm meeting these amazing people, and you get to know them. But in those early days especially, like it felt like every person I would get to know, I'd be like, oh, man, they're super cool. I can't wait to go to church with them. It felt like every person I met halfway through the conversation would be like, like, oh, yeah, and by the way, we're getting ready to leave the church. And then we meet another. And they'd be like, yeah, we're getting ready to leave the church. I'm like, what is wrong with this church? All the cool people are getting ready to leave. And then I find out that in three months after I got here, they're going to be launching this thing called Community Christian Church down the road. And you may wonder what happened. Here's what happened. Somebody stood up on this exact stage and just said, hey, we're doing this thing down in White Marsh, and we need like three to 600 people with beautiful feet to get up, walk out the door, and go start a brand new gospel work five miles down the road. And here's the thing you need to know. That kind of announcement happens in churches all over the world. Like people say stuff like that. Hey, we're trying to take the gospel to this new place. We need a whole bunch of people to do it. Hey, we got to create more room at this hour. We need a whole bunch of people to move to 815. That, those kinds of announcements happen in lots of churches. It's just in most churches, when that happens, everybody kind of folds their arms and looks sideways and is like, I hope somebody says yes to that, uh, but I'm staying put. But that wasn't what happened here. Hundreds of people, some of you said, all right. Somebody said, I'll go to White Marsh for a year. Somebody else said, I'll go to White Marsh for five years to help launch the thing. Some, some hundreds of people said, we're just going to move to White Marsh. We've got to make this thing happen. Uh, they're, they're church, White Marsh needs churches. We're just going. And this church kept doing it again and again. I remember talking to people because I was new here and I was trying to get connected and trying to understand. I was talking to people like, okay, what prompted you to, to leave the church you love, to walk the gospel to some new place? And person after person that I talked to said, well, you know how it is. If you have to choose between making yourself comfortable and reaching other people, I mean, you're going to choose reaching other people every time, aren't you? And I wanted to be like, Actually, no. Um, no. Most people put themselves first all the time. Like most people, if I have to choose between making myself comfortable and helping somebody else, I'll be comfortable. Like, like no. I mean, I'm not saying it's godly, but that's what's normal. And what, what was happening here, I'd never seen it before. Because uh, I'd seen a church where lots of people had beautiful feet. 
But I'd never seen a church where it just seemed like everybody you met had such beautiful feet. And I would just say personally, I'm so grateful for the 10 years we had here. Um, you all raised my boys. Uh, you were so good to us. I mean, oh my goodness, this church was good to us. But one of the things that I want to thank you for on behalf of me and Betsy and my boys, um, you gave us a spiritual pedicure. Uh, that's what you did. You taught us how to have beautiful feet. You taught us and inspired us to be messengers of the good news that God is victorious, that the enemy has been defeated, that peace has come, that salvation is at hand, that if we will just trust and wait on the Lord, soon the watchman will see and all will be revealed that our God has brought victory and salvation to all those who call on the name of the Lord. You taught us how to announce that. And my goodness, you all are still at it. I mean, we're talking about some things never change. This never changes about Mountain Christian Church. You, you walk to Bel Air, and then you walk to Edgewood, and then you walk to Abingdon, and then you walk to Aberdeen, and you're, you're getting ready to walk to Parkville, Lord willing. I, I love it. You keep sending out mission teams. Like a half dozen people left this morning at like 6 a.m., and I know very little about those people. I don't know their demographics. I don't know how tall they are. I don't know whether they're in shape or not. But I know one very specific thing about those people. My goodness, they have beautiful feet. You know how the TSA agents make them take off their shoes? It delayed the line five minutes because all they, they all took off their shoes simultaneously. They said, stop the line. Look at the feet of these 15 people in a row. My goodness. Because they have beautiful feet. Because beautiful are the feet in the security line of those who bring good news. You're in this season right now called unstoppable good, right? That's what I hear, unstoppable good. I've been thinking about that phrase. And you know how like um, scientists, they come up with names for groups of animals, right? Like it's a, a pride of lions and a, a flock of geese and that kind of thing, right? I was thinking... If you had to come up with a name for a group of people so passionate about the good news of God's victory that they would walk together the announcement of the victory into every dark corner of their lives, every dark corner of their neighborhood, every dark corner of the world, they would just link arm in arm and walk the good news of God's victory into every place. You had to come up with a name for that group of people. That's a pretty good name, isn't it? We're going to call that an unstoppable good. A group of people who recognize that we have been given the good news and we will bear that message into every place of desperation that we find. I'd call a group of people like that an unstoppable good. Now, I don't know, some of you, you know, you don't know me. You're brand new. You know, who's this guy who used to work here? You know, what are they doing? Uh, and I would just say, if you're new around here and you're thinking to yourself, I want to get plugged in. You know, I want to get connected. I want to be part of that last 200 years sounds pretty good. I want to be part of the next 200 years. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you should do because I don't work here anymore. Do we still tell people, do we still tell people to go to Welcome to Mountain? Is that what we say? Okay, great. All right. So if you're new here, your next step is go to Welcome to Mountain. But here's what I will tell you. If you're new around here, here's what I want to tell you. Get ready for a spiritual pedicure. Because around here, you are going to hear the good news. You are going to be taught the good news. You will be equipped to understand and receive the good news. And then you will be challenged to tell somebody the good news. Because this church has had beautiful feet for 200 years. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. Because our world still desperately needs the beautiful feet of gospel messengers who announce good news to hurting people. And there is good news. God is still for us and has eternal plans of good for our lives. And Christ has died and Christ has risen to accomplish the good plans of our God. 
And God still saves marriages, and God still breaks the chains of addiction, and God still brings faith where there was only doubt, and God brings meaning where we are lost, and God brings hope eternal if we would just wait and trust, for soon the watchman will see the salvation of our Lord is at hand. All the news is still news, and still true, and still good, and still needs a messenger. Here's how Paul puts it. When he writes a letter to the Roman church, he writes to the Roman church, he says this, everyone who trusts in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then he asks some questions. And I want you to think about these questions because these questions are just as true for us today as they were back then. I want you to think about the people you love that are in a desperate situation. The places you care about that are hurting and hopeless and don't know that the victory has been won. You think about those places. Listen to Paul's questions. How will they call on him if they have not trusted That question makes sense, doesn't it? How can they trust in him if they've never heard? That makes sense. How can they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news? The people you know and love, the people in the places where you live and work and play, the people you care about that are in hopeless, hurting, broken situations, okay? You know who I'm talking about. You might even know their name. You know, you know this is Bob. You've been working with him for 20 years. Man, he just, he, man, if somebody would just bring some good news into Bob's life, it'd make all the difference. This is your cousin, and man, she's going through such a hard time. And if somebody would bring some good news into her life, it would just, it would just make all the difference. It would give her the, the strength she needed to just hold on a little longer and wait for the salvation of God. So I'm just curious, what's your strategy for making sure they hear this good news. Because if your strategy is to hope that somebody else tells them, that's crazy, right? Like, you get that, right? Like, I'm not saying you're going to do anything about it, but just go with me on the logic here. You get that it's crazy if there's somebody you care about and you know and you love who's in a desperate situation and you wish they knew the news, but your strategy is just to hope that somehow somebody else tells them. Samuel Rogers, remember the good-looking fella who came here in 1821 we talked about earlier? He wrote an autobiography in 1876 or something in which he says... I do not believe that idle preachers actually believe the gospel. That's what he said. I know. I know some of you are worried. You're like, Ethan, you don't understand. I am not a worthy messenger of the gospel. Like, Ethan, I could never have beautiful feet. Like, if you saw my hairy toes and I got fungus going on there, and there's a, there's a thing the doctors haven't even discovered yet going on. Um, like, I, no, I couldn't have beautiful feet. I get you. I know what you're saying. But you need to understand what makes the feet of the messenger beautiful is not about the messenger. It's about the message what allows you to be bringer of light into dark places is not because you're so incredible. It's because the news is that good. Any fool who brought that news into a place of despair and hopelessness, it turns out their feet would be gorgeous. That's just how good the news is. And you can do this. 
You can walk into dark places and just be like, um, I've seen addicts get free. Like, I watched it happen. And some of you say, really, really? And you're like, all I know is that's the news. And, and I know that God loves us and God has a plan to rescue us. Really? And like, I don't know. That's just the news. And if you'll just wait, you'll, you'll, you'll see it. Some of you have friends, and maybe even you today are on the verge of surrendering to the enemies of God, surrendering to despair and surrendering to addiction and surrendering to hopelessness and surrendering to your rage because you don't know God won the victory. And, and what you need to be is a messenger into those places, and you get to say, don't surrender to the enemies of God, for they lost the battle already. Instead, surrender to God, for he is the one who reigns. So let me be clear. My analysis has been thorough and careful. I have sufficient evidence without requiring the removal of any socks. This church, since before its founding to the present day, is a church of beautiful feet. And that is who this church must be for 200 more years. And for that to happen, that is who you must be. Today, and tomorrow, and the next, and the next. You must be the people who learn the good news of the victory of God. And then walk that news into dark and desperate places. Do you need to be one of the people who signs up to help launch Parkville? I, of course, have no idea how to do that because I don't work here anymore. But surely somebody knows, right? There's got to be some method by which you can sign up to go help Parkville. Wouldn't it be cool if like 200 people just said, yeah, we're going to Parkville. We're going to move there, and we're going we're gonna to bring hope into all those places, not just on Sunday morning, but we're going to bring hope into the, oh, the TV just told me. This is how you sign up, right there. There you go. See, I knew somebody knew. That's how you sign up, right there. Wouldn't it be great if a couple hundred people who are safely in Harford County, tucked away, you know, said, I'm, I'm moving. I'm going to go walk the good news. I'm going to be part of an unstoppable good. I'm going to flink arms with 100, 200, 300 dollars. We're going to walk the good news into a place that, that needs to hear it. That'd be awesome. Maybe the place you need to walk the good news is across the street to your neighbors. Man, if you want to know what's been so special about this church for 200 years, it's the number of people who took the gospel across the street. That's it. The people of this church have beautiful feet. That is who you are, Mountain Christian Church. And it is who you will remain I want to remind you of some of those questions. And then I want to just pray a blessing over this church, if you'd let me. Because these questions, man, these are, these are for you today. Think of the people you love. Here are the questions. How can they be saved if they do not call upon the name of the Lord? How can they call upon the name of the Lord if they have not trusted him? How can they trust him if they have not heard about him? How can they hear unless someone preaches? Beautiful are the feet that bring good news. Let me pray for this church. I just want to bless this church. God, I believe that you have urgent plans for Mountain Christian Church. I believe that the role in your kingdom for Mountain Christian Church has been and continues to be significant. And so I pray the blessing of your spirit on those who lead this church, the staff and the elders. May you enliven them with a spirit of hope, a gospel-driven goodness. I pray for an outpouring of your spirit on all those who serve in the church, the difference makers who serve in every place and every corner. May you bless them and inspire them. I pray for everybody who calls this church home. We are asking God you to accomplish in our lives a spiritual pedicure. 
that you would open for us a door of mission where we can go into desperate and despairing places and declare that we know that the victory has been won. We know that it has been secured by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that there is hope, that the watchman will soon see the salvation of our Lord. And then we will look down and we will give you praise for you have made our feet beautiful. Would you do that, accomplish that in this church, your beloved Mountain Christian Church, for whom I pray every day. Amen.